Finally, we get to least squares. All the work we've been doing so far is going to finally pay off, and things are really going to start coming together. So here's our problem setup. We have y equals ax, where a is a vector in R m by n. So x and y are vectors here. So, you know, as usual, for a given y, we want to solve for x. So y and a are given to us, and we want to isolate and solve for x. So we already know that if a is square and invertible, we can solve for x exactly just by taking the inverse, where x equals a inverse times y. In plain English, we can interpret this this way. So if a is square and invertible, this means that we have the same number of equations and unknowns, and all the equations are unique. But here's the thing. In real life, we rarely have the same number of equations and unknowns. Actually, instead we often have more equations than unknowns. So m is greater than n. And you know from before that this type of matrix is called a skinny matrix. So in general, we can't satisfy all equations simultaneously. But the next best thing that we can do is to try to satisfy all equations as closely as possible. So how do we measure closeness? What does this mean? Each element of AX should be close to each corresponding element of Y. There's an idea. So for each specific value of X, we can compute something called the residual vector. It's just Y minus AX. And that represents how closely each equation is satisfied. So y minus ax is another vector, and each element tells you uh, the difference between y and ax at that element. If we square each element of the residual vector, and then sum all those together, we're going to get a single number that represents how closely all the equations are satisfied. And obviously, if all the elements of the residual vector are zero, that means that you've satisfied every equation perfectly, right? Um, but if you're a little bit off, um, it doesn't matter if you're above or below, both of them are equally bad. So we can instead think of the square, right? You could also think of absolute value, but square is a little more useful and it's, it's a lot easier to work with algebraically. Okay, so we square each element of the residual vector and we sum them, and the number that we get is called the residual sum of squares, the RSS. Okay, so the RSS is like one one number that just gives a summary of how closely we're, sat we're uh, satisfying the vector equation. Okay, so here's another idea. Let's choose x to minimize the RSS. And this is what least squares is all about. We're minimizing the sum of squares. Okay, so let's stop for a moment and think about the geometry here. Think about the definition of the range of a. Right, so we talked about range of a in a previous lecture. And, you know, you, you have some matrix A, and you have a bunch of input vectors, right? Those are the X's here. So you try all possible input vectors, and you're going to get a bunch of output vectors, all the possible output vectors associated with this matrix A, right? So if you plot all of those output vectors, that is going to form a linear subspace. So the thing is, the Y that we pick for the equation Y equals AX, that Y that's given to us, it might not be in the range of A, right? It might be outside of that linear subspace that is the range of A. Again, the next best thing that we can do is to find the vector AX that is closest to Y in terms of distance, in terms of ordinary Pythagorean distance. But here's the thing, the distance between the vector Y and AX is just the norm of Y minus AX. So geometrically, we can just project Y onto the subspace AX. So this last sentence might be tough to visualize. So let's look at a 2D example. So here I have two dimensional space and the horizontal axis is Y1, vertical axis is Y2. And let's be very careful here about uh, X's and Y's. So X, there's no X involved here at all. It's Y1 horizontally, Y2 vertically, and we're just plotting points in the space uh, Y1, Y2, right? So here I have the vector 3, 1, so y1 is 3, y2 is 1, uh, and this vector is just hanging out there. But imagine I take this vector and I multiply it by a scalar, x1. So I wrote x1 here as a matrix, a 1 by 1 matrix, just so that uh, we can generalize it easier later. But we're going to get some new y1 and y2, right, by varying this value of x1. 
right? So we started out with just the vector 3, 1, which is a point in y1, y2 space, right? But now we're letting y1 and y2 be variables. And the way that we create uh, this new point y1, y2 is by taking the original vector 3, 1 and multiplying it by the scalar x1. Uh, I think it's clear to everybody that this forms a line. All the y1, y2 points that we can produce, they have to lie on this line. We cannot produce something that doesn't lie on this line uh, using just this scalar x1. So x1 is like the step along this line. So this is what we mean when we're talking about y equals ax. So now, instead of having just the variable y, let's have a specific y given to us, some target that's given to us, right? We have y1 equals 3, y2 equals 2 in this example on the left-hand side, and I've plotted it in blue, and too bad, it doesn't lie on the line. So what do we do? Well, uh, we try to find the closest point. So we can produce points only that lie on the line, um, but we're trying to get as close as possible to the blue point. So we can try a few different line segments, and that line segment represents a distance, right? So there could be a point there on the line, um, and we could choose a different point. And, you know, we could try a bunch of different points until we find the closest one. But again, I think it's pretty clear to everyone that the perpendicular, that line segment that's perpendicular between um, the blue point and the line, that is going to give us the closest point. So there, I've drawn the closest point as AXLS, LS for least squares. And XLS is just whatever... Uh, value of x was needed to get to that point. So a x l s is the uh, vector or point in the range of a uh, that is closest to the blue point. So now let's think about this in three dimensions. So we have this blue 2D plane and that is uh, the range of this matrix A here, but it's a 2D plane embedded in three dimensions, right? So A uh, has three rows and two columns and we have a two vector here, x1, x2. So you can think about it this way. We multiply the first column of a by x1, and we multiply the second column of a by x2, and we add those together. So x1 gives us the step that we take along the line uh, represented by the first column of a, and x2 represents the step we take along the second column of a, right? And those two lines form this plane. So x1, x2 are the coordinates, right, in the space defined by the two columns of A. And it's pretty clear that there are lots of uh, three-dimensional points, lots of y's that do not lie on this plane. For example, if we're given this purple point, this is a potential y, right, a three-dimensional vector. And this point, you know, we, we can project it onto the plane. So we find uh, the perpendicular, we go straight down until we hit the plane, and that point there is the closest thing that we could find to the purple point. That is our least squares solution. Now here's where things get interesting. So I haven't told you yet how to actually calculate xls, right? So geometrically, I, I gave you a solution. Uh, you just try different points until you get uh, the closest one, or you just uh, follow the perpendicular line until you uh, intersect the line or the plane or whatever linear subspace you have. But it turns out that if you go back to algebra, you can actually find a closed form solution. And, and this is really amazing. So let's look at the residual vector. So we have the norm of y minus ax, and we know now that that is the distance between y and uh, the closest point that we found. And here we're going to actually square the norm because it's going to make the math easier. And it should be clear to you that if we try to find x, to minimize this expression. Uh, that's the same as finding x to minimize just the norm without the square. Um, those two expressions are going to reach the minimum at the same value of x. So let's just deal with the square. So this is nice because, you know, the square of the norm of a vector is just uh, the vector transpose times the vector. So what we can do here is distribute the transpose. So remember, you, you have to flip the terms in the product. Um, so you get, uh, so the transpose of uh, AX is X transpose, A transpose. So now what you can do is distribute the multiplication. So you get Y transpose Y minus 2Y transpose AX plus X transpose A transpose AX. Okay, look at this for a moment. And uh, remember that 
y and a are given to us, they're constants. x is the only thing here that's a variable. So we want to minimize this expression with respect to x. So uh, maybe you can recall from calculus that the way to minimize something um, is to take, take the derivative and set it to zero. So that's exactly what we are going to do. So in this case, um, we're going to take the gradient with respect to x and set it to zero. So uh, x is a vector, right? So we're to take this multidimensional derivative, the gradients. Um, and, you know, many of you may not be familiar with uh, vector uh, calculus, but that's okay. Um, we're going to barely use it in this course. And when we do use it, I'm just going to spoon feed it to you. So here we're taking the gradient with respect to x of the expression we just found, right? So uh, a lot of your intuition from single variable calculus is going to carry over into vector calculus. We're taking the gradient with respect to x of this expression, and we have three terms, right? And we can just split this up. So the, you know, the derivative of a sum of terms is the same as the sum of the derivatives. So we just, you know, split up everything here. And let's look at the first term here. It's the gradient of, uh, it's the gradient with respect to x of y transpose y. But remember that y, it's constant, it's, it's given to us. Um, and there's no x showing up here, right? So the derivative of constant is just zero. So if we move on to the second term, we just have one x here, right? So we can just, you know, drop the x, basically. The thing here, though, is that with vector calculus, um, you have to take the transpose as well. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details here, but in this case, we end up with minus 2a transpose y. So then the third and final term, x transpose a transpose ax, right? We take the gradient with respect to x of that, and we drop one of the x's. So what we get is uh, plus 2a transpose a x. And we're going to set that whole thing equal to zero. So the equation became a lot simpler here, right? And all we have to do is take the negative term and move it to the other side. And then we cancel the twos. And finally, we get a transpose a x equals a transpose y. So this is a very famous equation. It is called the normal equation. And it pops up in lots of different fields. So uh, if you take machine learning later, especially shallow machine learning, uh, you're going to see this equation, and now you know the context. So we're not done yet. Uh, we need to isolate x. Here's where linear algebra comes in. So here's a fact. If a is skinny and full rank, then a transpose a is invertible. So I'm not going to prove it to you. Uh, you can do that on your own. It's not that complicated. So the key thing to know here is that it's full rank. So think carefully about why that means a transpose a is invertible. So right now, I'm just going to state that as a fact. Um, but I think you can see now where we are going with this. So we have the normal equation here. We want to isolate x. So a transpose a is invertible. So all we do is just multiply both sides by the inverse, right? So x equals the inverse of a transpose a times a transpose times y. All right, we are done. So that is how you find the x that corresponds to the closest point in the range of a to y. So this is the x that best satisfies that system of equations. Just a little bit of housekeeping here. Let's call this xls, and let's take all those a's and call them a dagger. All right. So in math, you know, you run out of numbers, you run out of letters, uh, then you go to Greek letters, you run out of those, and then at a certain point, uh, you just start using random symbols. So that's what we're doing now. Uh, that thing there, yeah, it's called a dagger. Uh, this is actually commonly used notation. So a dagger, we're defining that to be uh, this big expression, you know, inverse uh, of a transpose a times a transpose. That whole thing is called a dagger. And that is known as the pseudo inverse of a. If a is square, a could have an inverse, right? But a in this case is skinny. Uh, so there's no way it could have an inverse. But if it's skinny and full rank, it will always have a pseudo inverse, right? So this thing, this a dagger is always going to be defined. It's always going to exist. Um, and by the way, uh, I used a triple equal sign here. So if you ha haven't seen that before, uh, that just means that a dagger is defined to be uh, blah, blah, blah. So um, it's not an equation, it's a definition. And one last thing here. So the pseudo inverse in this case is the more Penrose inverse. So they're actually different kinds of pseudo inverses. Um, but the most common type is the more Penrose inverse. That's the one we're using here. 
And in conversation, if somebody says pseudo inverse and they don't give any uh, further context, then they almost always are referring to the more Penrose inverse. Okay. I think linear algebra just has badass terminology, and more Penrose inverse is just one of those terms. Okay, so one last thing here to wrap things up. So we found XLS, right, with the procedure from before by using the pseudo inverse. Um, but note that um, let's define A times XLS to be this thing called Y hat. So another symbol for you there, that thing on top is called a caret or a hat. So we just call it Y hat. And Y hat is defined to be A times XLS. So this is the vector in the range of A that is closest to Y. So uh, just, you know, uh, spelling things out for you here. Um, y hat, if you plug in um, the equation for XLS, right? We put in the pseudo inverse uh, and then we put in a Y at the end, right? So Y hat is this long expression here. All we did is put an A in front of what we're doing before, right? Just to clean things up, Y hat equals A times A dagger of Y. XLS is computed by multiplying A dagger and Y, right? So all we did is put A in front, and that gives us the vector in the range of A that is the closest point to Y, right? So that A, A dagger, that's a matrix, and we call that the projection matrix because it projects Y onto the range of A. By the way, this is also known as the hat matrix because it puts a hat on Y, right? So on the right-hand side, we have Y, that's our input, and we pre-multiply it by this A, A dagger, and as the output, we get Y hat. Right, so y goes to y hat. All right, so that wraps things up. So there's a lot of theory there, but it's very important. And right now, it's probably not clear to you just how mind-blowing um, what you just learned was. So next time, we're going to go over the statistical interpretation of least squares. Like, wh why do we care about all that stuff we just did? And, you know, there really is a limitless number of applications of least squares. It pops up in, honestly, every quantitative field. And we'll go through some numerical examples, so this will give you a feel of how to use least squares.